Well, had I planned it better, we could have talked about these mothers on Mother's Day, but that's the closest you're going to get to a Mother's Day sermon this year, so you might want to apply it now and then reapply it in a couple weeks. If you've ever looked, there are plenty of uh, blogs out there that tell you all the different types of mothers. Uh, even the psychologists try to frame them in different uh, uh, mothering uh, 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 or types of, of mothering that exists. Uh, a lot of them like to bear it down, uh, boil it down to five types of mothers. Um, you'll see that that doesn't work out that well. But uh, the, the five that are most common are, they say, you know, the perfectionist mother. Uh, typically, you know, an over-controlling, kind of fearful, anxious mom where appearance is very important and things have to be together. Uh, there's the unpredictable mother who governs or mothers completely by whatever mood she's in. So the rules are always changing. The parenting style is always changing. Uh, there's the best friend mom, you know, the cool mom, uh, who uh, really just wants to be an equal with their child, doesn't have to set any boundaries that way. It makes it a lot easier uh, as far as uh, doing the uncomfortable things. Uh, they say there's the me first mother where... You know, she's had a child, but that's not going to change her routine any, that she's going to keep living just like she did before, and then hopefully this child in independence will also come up uh, and just kind of learn on their own as they watch their mom go about their independent life. And then they say there's the complete mother that combines the best elements of all of these other types uh, and obviously uh, denies a lot of the weaknesses. Uh, the bad news is, uh, according to the... the particular author of this, the, the doctor that authored this particular article, Dr. Poulter, he said only 10% of mothers fall in that category. Uh, I'm sure the percentages are much higher in this room, but, but for the 90% of others out there, it's pretty dismal. Of course, we know there's more types than just those five. You know, you've got the helicopter mom and the competitive mom, and you know, around here you have the wine moms. Uh, <laughs> The, the workout moms, you know, the free range moms, or, you know, it's like the, the moms of the, the unschooling movement. Uh, there's the exclusive breastfeeding moms, you know, the crunchy moms, uh, the pessimists. Uh, maybe you've seen the social media mom, or maybe you are the exhausted mom, or, or the hot mess mom. Uh, maybe you've met uh, the martyr mom, you know, the duty bound kind. Uh, there are all sorts or types, we think, of mothers. But Paul boils it down to two types. And he puts it before us in this text this morning. He says there's two types of mothers that exist, and you're born of one of them. And he's not asking us to find out what kind of mothers we may be, but he wants us to know who our mother is if we're to live rightly and what's going to come after this text. Uh, for Paul, there are two mothers, and these two mothers show to us either the way of nature or the way of grace or the way that Paul places it in this text, the way of slavery or the way of freedom. And so let us get to know our mother a bit this morning from Galatians chapter 4. And you'll see the text just opens with a question. Uh, after several weeks of being away from the book of Galatians, is probably a good text to be in because it really does summarize all of Paul's argument up till now, and it is kind of the conclusion of the polemic part of his uh, epistle. He's been arguing about a certain form of false doctrine that has made its way into the church, and once he's done concluding this argument, he wants to then move into what we might call, in you kind of uh, uh, modern terms, the application portion of his epistle, where he wants to start talking about what it means now that we have come to this sort of gospel. How does that affect our community? How does it affect our life? How does it affect uh, our ethic, one with another, and so forth? But our text opens with Paul putting the doctrinal error that he's been countenancing for four chapters before us in probably the most clear-cut and starkest terms that he's done it so far. He's given us hints as to what the problem might be. He's definitely given us language where we could infer what the, 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 the potential false teaching was. But here he tells us in black and white what the problem is. He says, tell me you who desire to be under the law. And so clearly the false teaching that has come into the church is there's a group of people seeking to put the church 
back under the Mosaic legislation to say that they should be living under the laws of Torah in order to be fully Christian, or if you will, to become true and full sons of Abraham. I mean, you can gather from Paul's language the basic argument that has been coming from these teachers, and he is seeking to persuade them, of course, away from this false narrative. The false teachers are saying things like, hey, well, welcome to the family of God, you know. Welcome, LaPierres. We're glad you're here. Uh, you're in all by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, now that you've done that thing, there's some other things that you should probably know. If you want to become a full-fledged member here, you know, we got you in with the, you know, the initial condo sales pitch. But here's the, the real brass tacks, all the fine print, all the things they say in the commercial real fast. Uh, he says, you know, if you really want to be a good Christian, you should also be obeying the law of Moses. True sons of Abraham are circumcised. True sons of Abraham follow Torah and so forth. I mean, good start by believing in the Messiah. Now you just got to finish by putting yourself back under the law of Moses. And so Paul asks the question, so you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And then you would think he's going to tell us a bunch of things from the law, but he doesn't. He then goes into this story that is extremely confusing uh, as far as interpretation is concerned. So the second thing we want to see this morning is there are two types of mothers. There's this opening question, and the answer to the question is found in these two types of mothers. Paul wants to kill the temptation of the Galatian church once and for all to go back to the law. And so he does so by using this allegory that, again, has caused no small amount of consternation over the years concerning interpretation. Mainly because when we hear the word allegory in our world, we tend to think, well, if it's an allegory, then it didn't really happen in history. So, you know, if, if the Abraham-Sarah story is being used allegorically by Paul, is he saying he doesn't believe in the history of Abraham and Sarah? Which is surely not what he's saying. He refers to Abraham as a historical figure many times in his epistles, and obviously it's used, he's used that way constantly throughout the New Testament. But if it is used as an allegory, what is Paul meaning by that? Well, we'll see, instead of saying this is not a historical event, Paul is rather interpreting the historical events of the life of Abraham and Sarah through a lens that was hinted at in the prophets, in particular the prophet Isaiah, and comes to fruition in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that was a mouthful, but hopefully it won't be that confusing as we go. What's Paul's point? He begins with this question, haven't you heard what the law says? And then he goes into this comparison between two moms. But even that isn't fair, really, because he doesn't just compare two moms. He also then says they have two sons. And then he also says, but anyway, these moms are two covenants. And anyway, these two covenants are two cities. Uh, it's a pretty uh, uh, interesting growing metaphor allegory as he goes. And therefore, because it's growing and because it's very confusing at one level, people don't know what to do with it. It's no wonder that it has given people in the history of interpretation some amount of problems. But if we take a step back, we will see that this text isn't first and foremost about moms or kids or covenants or cities at all, but rather two ways of being in answer to the question, have you not heard the law? Have you not heard what the law says? And the two ways of being when you stand in front of the law is you can either be a slave to that law or you can be free. And that's really what he wants to get at. Are you going to live under the slavery of the law or are you going to be free from that law? And he uses this allegory to help answer the question for them, and in one sense to tell them it's already been answered in their case, now they need to live according to it. You see, there's two ways that one can live based on the two lines of descent from Abraham. Now, again, we don't normally think like that, but if the agitators are saying things like, hey, good start, we're glad you came to faith in Jesus, but we as true Jews, those who have been nurtured, under the Mosaic law, us true sons of Abraham, if you want to be fully one of us, here's what you need to do. Paul says, oh, yeah, you're sons of Abraham. But Abraham had two sons. 
And so you need to decide which son you are, which tribe you belong to. Are you of the son that comes from Sarah's line, Isaac? Or are you the son that comes from the line of the slave, Hagar's son, Ishmael? So you'll notice there is this stark contrast between slavery and freedom that goes all throughout this text. So notice in the slave column, he calls Hagar a slave woman. Ishmael is the son of the slave woman, according to the flesh. He says it's comparable to the covenant at Sinai, which bears children for slavery, like the current city of Jerusalem, which in its Judaism is in slavery even now with its children. He says that's one column of slavery. He says, and there's another column of freedom which has Sarah, she's never named, but she is called the free woman. And Isaac, the son born of the free woman, according to promise. And there's a covenant that's associated with that. And the Jerusalem that's associated with it is above, and it is free, and it is the mother of us all, Paul says. It's clear that slavery versus freedom really is the topic at hand, and the topic is driven by these people coming in and agitating the church and trying to bring them back under the law of Moses. And as soon as they do that, Paul says, no, to do that is to become a slave. And we have been made free. Well, how? So how does this strange allegory answer Paul's concerns? Well, you have to know the Old Testament story a bit to get what he's going after. And most of us know it at least in its bare outline. Abraham and Sarah, old in age, couldn't have children. Uh, God had promised them children. It wasn't occurring. And so uh, this great shame that Sarah had to bear in being childless finally got to her to such a point where she decided it was time to help the promise along. And she came to Abraham with her slave, Hagar, and she said, take my slave. Go into her, bear a child through her for me, which was not an uncommon practice back then. And so Abraham does take Hagar, makes her his wife, makes her his wife, uh, and uh, bears a son through Hagar. And as soon as Hagar gives birth, the text tells us that she grew arrogant about it. She despised her master. She despised Sarah. It was like, you know, what was so hard about that? It didn't take long, and here I am pregnant, and you, the mistress of the house, unable to bear a child. You know, shameful state in that particular time period. Well, as soon as Sarah catches on that uh, Hagar is disrespecting her, she's had enough. And so she tells Abraham her, her frustration, and he says, well, you know, she's your servant. Do whatever you want with her. And so Sarah casts her out. Uh, and, uh, well, she doesn't cast her out. She treats her harshly enough to where Hagar starts to leave to flee the scene. And an angel comes and interrupts the situation and says, no, you got to go back. And here's the name of your son. Call him Ishmael and so on and so forth. Well, 18 years later, after this scene has unfolded, Sarah gives birth to her own son, Isaac. And at the weaning of Isaac, it says that, Ishmael is, is teasing him, laughing at the, at the son, at Sarah's own son born of her own womb, and Sarah won't have it. She tells Abraham, this son of the slave woman is not going to sit here and do that to the, sl the son of the inheritance, you know, this natural born son to our home. He will not inherit with Isaac. And so Abraham sends his first son, Ishmael, off with Hagar with the promise that God would protect them on their way. And Paul says, see, right there, that's you. That's the story of your life. Get it? <laughs> you don't get it? Uh, well, if you don't get it, uh, Paul gives us an interpretive key to help us get it when he quotes that text from Isaiah that we read this morning. He quotes Isaiah chapter 54, a prophecy concerning a barren woman whose fortunes are immediately reversed by God's favor. And of course, that text is about Israel, Israel in a state of exile, when God had uh, pushed her aside and abandoned her, and she was no longer living in the land and no longer being fruitful and multiplying. And God says, don't worry, 
Because someday I'm going to remarry you and you are going to have so many children that we're going to have to expand the borders of our tents. That we're going to do a whole full you know, home remodel because we're going to need more space and more rooms. There's just going to be children busting out of the seams. And though you've been barren all this time and though you've been shamed because of it, and even though the, the, the wife who's born many children in your sight has made you feel lowly, that feeling is going to pass and I'm going to bring you honor and glory on the day of your reversal. And again, while we may not see the connection easily, it has to do with this text. Notice first, there's two women in Isaiah's text. There's this barren woman who has never experienced labor. She's never had a child and she's grieved because of it. And then there's this other woman who's a wife and she's been able to bear easily. And Paul says, don't you see? That's Sarah and Hagar. And he's not just making that that, that out of nowhere, Isaiah has told us just a couple chapters earlier that Israel as a nation were born from Sarah, their mother. The only time Sarah's ever mentioned out of the book of Genesis is three chapters before these verses are mentioned in Isaiah 54. And Paul, in his reading of Isaiah, says, okay, Israel is born of Sarah. And there's this barren woman who's grieving, and there's another woman who's able to have children. That's Sarah and Hagar. That was the situation of the Old Testament. And as an Israelite, if you're reading about a barren woman who is grieving in her barrenness, Sarah is the barren woman par excellence, that God finally comes and changes her situation. And if God's coming and saying, you are barren now, but I'm going to reverse your fortunes and you will have many children, it would have immediately come into the Israelite imagination, the story of Sarah and the very fact that the whole nation of Israel is born of her. So what? I mean, how does that answer Paul's question about the law and slavery and freedom and our Christian life? Well, between these two women... There was the same man, Abraham. And it became apparent from the story that biologically, he was still able to have children, right? Uh, I don't have to give a full biology lesson today, but uh, the physical weakness, if you will, clearly in the text, lay with Sarah. Sarah had passed her childbearing years. She had gone through menopause. Her womb was as good as dead. Having kids for her was just not possible at her age. Hagar was younger. She clearly was in the prime of her childbearing years. All that was needed was the normal effort and procreation. And so when Abe took her as his wife, you'll notice they had a child soon after. That showed that for him, having children wasn't a problem. It was still possible with a little trying. <laughs> but not for Sarah. For her to have a child, God had to do something. He had to bring life out of death in her womb if she was going to have a child. When she does get pregnant, everyone knows it was God's doing. It would be the very same for Israel when God repopulated her and brought her out from exile. It would be clear that this was God's doing and it was wonderful in their sight. You see, for Sarah, biology isn't enough. Effort isn't enough. Only the promise of God is sufficient. Only it will do. And in that way, she is just like the Abrahamic covenant, a covenant of promise. God will do it. He swore by himself, and he will keep his oath to Abraham. Paul says, see, it makes total sense. Sarah uh, can't do anything by her own effort, and God doesn't require anything in the Abrahamic covenant by effort. It's all God's doing on both fronts. But Hagar... Contrarily, is like the Mosaic Covenant, a covenant of doing, a do this and live sort of reality. Her and Abraham can take care of it. They did the, the natural thing, the natural way, the way of the flesh. They used human effort, they did things, and behold, there was life. But only one son inherits, Paul says, and it's the son of promise. Isaac, the son of effort, the son of flesh, the son of the normal way of human doing, is cast away. So Paul wants to simply know one thing from us this morning. And that is, who is your mother? 
That's what he's asking the Galatians, and that's what he wants to bring to us. Paul wants to know from the church, who is your mom? What is your source? Because there is one mom that stands for one covenant that is being promoted heavily by present-day Jerusalem in, in Paul's time. He's saying, don't you get it? These Judaizers who are coming to you from the capital city with the law of Moses in hand and saying, become like us, become Jews in order to become true Christians, to become real sons of Abraham. They're coming and saying, just have the right biology and just do, uh, you know, put your little work in with a little effort in the keeping of the law of Moses, you'll be fine. And Paul says that way leads to slavery. Because the law always asks for more, and you will never be able to say that you're done, and therefore it always brings condemnation. It sets forth commands and demands, and it will never cease the next day and say to you, fine, you've done enough. And he says, if you want to put yourself under that, if you want to put yourself under that slavery, you can, but that is the way of normal human effort, the way of do this, and you will live. He says, or there's a second, there's a second mother that stands for the covenant of promise that comes down from the Jerusalem that is above. This covenant is based wholly on the oath of God, where he swore by himself that he would take care of it. It's not based on performance, and therefore it always ends well, precisely, because it doesn't depend on you. He says, that, you know, this is the kind of mom that, you know, has a big Easter basket for you and a, a hug when you get home. The other one's the stern mom with the crooked finger that's always telling you to pick up your stuff. And Paul says, which one do you want? The one that loves you unconditionally just because you're her son? Or the one that's always going to ask for more? You'll notice Paul is saying, this is how all this analogy works for us. He says, for us to be saved... It's just as impossible as for Sarah to have a baby in old age. He's saying to these Galatian Gentiles, how do you think you're going to be made right with God? Are you going to be made right with God through the human effort way, through the Hagar way, through the way of working according to the law? Guess what? You try and you will be a slave. You will never be done with the bondage that comes there and you will live under condemnation. He says, if you want to be okay in God's eyes, it's just as impossible as an old woman bearing a son in her old age, long past her time of fertility. Paul would say to us, Christians are such, not by natural process, not by doing our best with what God has given us, not by a little bit of effort and some trust in God, but we are Christians because he has given us life from the dead. Because God called something that was not and made it something that was. He says, you are dead, I raise you to newness of life. Not based on anything in you or done by you, wholly based on my promise without any effort on your part. As W.H. Auden wrote, nothing can save us that is possible. Think of those words. Nothing can save us that is possible. That's the whole Hagar way, right? Sarah and Abraham were like, this way will work. This is a way that you can do something and, and make things happen. And, and Auden is saying, do you want to be saved? The doing things way won't work. You can't do enough to be right with God. Instead, he says, we who must die, we demand a miracle. And that's what our salvation is. It is a miracle by God where he brings life from the dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. As one author writes, the normal ways that we think God works get turned on their head by a God who doesn't wait for you to get to Him, but who comes to you first. He doesn't help those who help themselves. He helps those who cannot help themselves. He doesn't wait for you to go one yard before he goes 99. He gives you the victory before you even come out of the locker room. He is not a gentleman waiting for you to open the door on which he is patiently knocking. He doesn't need a handle on his side of the door. He's kicking it down. He is a doctor come to rescue the sick. 
He comes not for the righteous, but for sinners. He is in the resurrection business. And here is Paul's punchline. If you reject these Judaizers and their law-keeping message, and you just embrace the promise of God by faith, notice what he says, you are by grace Abraham's descendants, and like Isaac, sons from the line of promise, residents of the true Jerusalem that comes from above, not the Jerusalem down the road that's still in slavery with her children. And so he says in conclusion, therefore it's time to kick Hagar's kids down the road. <laughs> Which is in, he's saying to the church, any teaching that comes through the threshold of these doors that would put you back under the idea of effort for earning your inheritance with God, he says, you've got to cast away that bondwoman and her son. That is not, that is no longer a possibility for us because we know that way of working leads to slavery and we are children of promise that have been given freedom. The way of the law is the way that lies, that way lies madness and slavery. It cannot be done, and we have no ability to accomplish it. That idea that Paul is going to play on now, even when he gets into his ethics, his ethics are based on this kind of freedom. You'll notice a very strange way of trying to uh, get people uh, to change their way of being, their morality. He says, you're utterly free. That's what's going to change you more than anything. That idea scares us. I mean, utter freedom scares us. Something being all of grace is very frightening. Grace is scary. For God to say to us, you know, the game is over. It's really finished. It's all done. There's nothing left for you to do. It's all beyond any kind of deserving. You're not going to ever ingratiate yourself to me. There's nothing you can do to get one step closer to me. And not only does he say that his love for you is that irresponsible, at least in our way of seeing things, he then calls us in our freedom to be that irresponsible with our love to other people. He says, well, you know what? You can be that gracious to people. You can be that kind. You can be that forgiving. You can actually expect nothing from them and still do good to them. You can actually lose an argument and have it be okay, which is very hard for me. I mean, oftentimes you see the church or even ourselves, we start with the idea of free grace. We are fine with the idea of grace, full and free. But once you get in, isn't there something to do? Isn't there something that we have to keep on doing if God's going to keep on loving us this freely? Isn't there something we can do to prove our worth to God that he made a good choice? Or isn't there something we can do to show that we're more grateful? Isn't there more serving or more giving? But of course, as soon as you start putting those things out, you're in slavery all over again. For freedom, Christ has set you free. And so Paul would say to you, embrace it, believe it, enjoy it. And you will see in the weeks to come that this grace, this freedom is what births what the law has always failed to do. It births righteousness. And so may we lean into the grace of God and may we be delighted that God has done for us what even he has done for Sarah, the impossible. Let's pray.